if you imagine a hell that you know, the real situation in Xinjiang is 100 times worse than that. A dystopian surveillance state where every interaction can be watched, every conversation heard. There is no freedom uh, for Uyghur people. Government workers sent to live in people's homes to monitor them. It's not like proper life you want to have. There's the human rights abuse in plain sight, and then there's the hidden. I lost contact with my family three years back. People rounded up and detained in internment camps. First-hand reports of systematic rape, torture, forced labour, forced sterilisation. If I do contact him, then he may be back to the uh, concentration camp again, so I just don't want to take that risk. In 2018, the US State Department put the number of detentions at possibly more than 2 million, and now the US and others have begun calling it genocide. I can count at least 20 people. I lost contact. I don't know where are they. Human rights violations on an almost inconceivable scale against the minority Muslim Uyghur people in Xinjiang, a region of far western China. If I speak so loudly, maybe my full family, all family would get killed. Maybe I will get killed. The New Zealand government has expressed concern, but it hasn't backed those words with action. We rely on China for trade, $32 billion worth. We can't travel there anymore, not just because of COVID, but because journalists can't freely report. So we've used extensive reference material, photos, video, people's descriptions, to build the city. This detention centre. This factory, to give you a sense of what it's like, so we can tell the story of how all of us, including our government, are implicated. China is trying to eradicate the Uyghur people. Rizwan girl Noor Muhammad wants our help. She's tried the New Zealand government and the Chinese embassy, and nothing has worked. Riz is a New Zealand citizen. She came here in 2010. I was born Uyghur. I was born to Uyghur family. So Uyghur is my identity. It's like God-given, you know? It's part of me. I, can't, I can never get rid of it, right? Why should I get rid of it? She wants our help because of what's happened to her brother, Maulan Nur Muhammad. It was 2017 and Maolan was working as a fibre network engineer for China Telecom in Bowler City, Xinjiang. He's my youngest brother, the only brother. He's always there, you know. Um, like after I, especially after I lost my father, he was the one that I always turned to, to talk to. By 2017, Maolan was a husband and father of a baby boy, but three years earlier, he'd been to Turkey to study. At that time, there were a lot of business opportunities that require Turkish language. Which you'd think would be uncontroversial, but it seems this trip to Turkey was enough to anger the CCP, the Chinese government. He was having lunch at the local restaurant during his lunch break from work. A few uh, policemen in civilian clothes, they came to arrest him. They didn't provide any explanation why they are arresting him. He was taken for questioning and then we expected that he would be freed soon because he has nothing he, done, he has done nothing wrong. What was the charge? <laughs> the charge was splitting the state, which means secession. 
But what does that even mean? What was he accused of doing? There has no any official information. And no trial? Has, no trial has provided to justify such um, imprisonment. What sentence was he given? I really don't want to even mention this sentence because it does not make sense. My, my brother does not deserve to have such sentence. He's an innocent person. But he was given a sentence. It is nine years, 19 years, 29 years. It doesn't make big difference for me. It is injustice. It is unfair. It shouldn't happen. Yet it's happening to everyone we meet in the New Zealand Uyghur community. Around 100 Uyghurs live here, and they all have a story of someone who's disappeared, though most are terrified to be seen telling it. Why do you not want us to see your face? I worry that CCP might harm my family. If I speak truth, they retaliate my loved ones on back home. What do you fear that retaliation might look like? They might go into jail or concentration camp or unimaginable torture. Do you feel safe in New Zealand? Not, not even here because they have a big influence in New Zealand. They can do anything to, to your family members. That's why you don't want to show your face? Yes. Just a couple are prepared to take the risk. This is something I have to do. I have to tell the truth. I wish the New Zealanders to know, so I am speaking. Which family members are you worried about? All of them. Just, I am alone in the free world. My mother signed a form. She is not allowed to contact with me. And your mother signed that form? Yes. But because? She, she, she can't say no, otherwise she will be in jail as well. I am sure she wants to hear my voice, and of course I want to hear her voice as well. But if we do, if I call her, and the, the police will come to her and take her away. One communication you've showed us between you and your mum before she passed away. She's holding up a handwritten note to you. Why did she have to handwrite that? and hold it up to you? Why could she not just ask you, tell you? Because there is a monitoring system in WeChat um, that picks up the keywords. So whatever they say, is going to be recorded and used against them. What did she write? She wrote, you must provide all of your information around where you live, where you study, what are you doing in New Zealand to the police as soon as possible, otherwise they will lock up your father, your brother, enemy. What is the Chinese government doing to your people? They want to wipe us out. This is a um, type of uh, genocide. What is that like for you to watch from afar? One thing, I get frustrated that um, so we feel like we left alone. No one cares about us. Most of the Uyghurs we're speaking to are New Zealand citizens. So does New Zealand care? Good afternoon. Welcome to China. In 2019, the Prime Minister met with the Chinese President Xi Jinping and Premier Li on an official visit to Beijing. To underline the importance that we place on our relationship with China. It is one of our most important and far-reaching relationships. Saying afterwards that she'd raised the Uyghur issue directly with the president. In 2020, New Zealand joined 38 other countries to criticise China, calling for immediate free access to Xinjiang for international observers. And then more recently... We have consistently as a nation raised concerns uh, around what we've seen uh, with the Uyghurs. We've raised it at the highest level. I raised it face to face with the leadership when we were in um, Beijing. I don't know what could be stronger than raising it face to face 
with the leadership in Beijing. Speaking behind closed doors is one thing, but other countries are doing more. Mr. Speaker, internment camps, arbitrary detention, political re-education, forced labour, torture, and forced sterilisation, all on an industrial scale. It is truly horrific. Mr. Speaker, we have a moral duty to respond. Here in the UK, we must take action to make sure that UK businesses are not part of the supply chains that lead to the gates of the internment camps in Xinjiang. As a committee, we found that genocide, in fact, is occurring. We also found and recommend that the government of Canada consider asylum for these people, those who are subject to crimes against humanity. You might think it's easy for the UK and Canada to be critical when they send only around 5% of their exports to China and we send a quarter of ours. But Australia sends even more of its exports to China than we do and it's not pulling its punches. To ignore the plight of the Uyghurs would send a signal to every nation around the world that Australia doesn't care about human rights as long as its powerful trading partner is trampling on them. We must speak out against this. And more importantly, we must act. And it has. In 2020, Australia introduced legislation banning the importation of goods from Xinjiang and goods produced by forced labour in other parts of China. So what, practically, have we done? In many ways, it seems like it's in the too hard basket for New Zealand. Our colleague Anna Fifield is the former Beijing correspondent for The Washington Post. She has reported extensively on the Uyghur oppression. How compromised are we by the fact that our two-way trade is worth $32 billion a year? Are we scared to take on China? I think many countries are scared to take on China because China has shown that it will react economically and diplomatically with impunity. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be following suit and raising these same issues and continuing to show China that we won't stand for this. This is not in line with our values because I think when we look back on this, we will want to know that we have stood up for what we believed in and not just being kind of mercenaries to our uh, economy and our trading relationship. I would have thought that, um, that something would have been done by now since it's been so long and so, so many people have been suffering. That, like, after all this time, how come we haven't really, like, done anything big, you know? The consequence of being scared to take on China is that we're in danger of putting business relationships before the persecution of a people. As part of our investigation, we've zeroed in on New Zealand's links to the technology driving the most intensive surveillance in the world. And the surveillance comes in the form of high-tech surveillance, cameras, um, uh, tapping into to phones, monitoring telephone conversations, um, doing cell phone checks uh, on the street. Essentially, no one uh, is, is completely um, free or can avoid the, the purview of the state. Which even includes Uyghurs being forced to give up their biometric data, DNA samples, fingerprints, and voice prints, or samples of speech. Voice print technologies frightening because you could identify someone from an, anonym, an, an anonymous recording of a telephone call. You can figure out exactly who that person is by their unique voice print. And the leading producer of voice print technology is a company called iFlytech. I am AI. I am iFlytech. A multi-billion dollar enterprise that specializes in artificial intelligence and robots. iFlytech is a massive um, homegrown Chinese company part owned by the Chinese government. It's very much a part of the system. And since 2017, there have been concerns raised publicly about iFlytech's technology being used in the human rights violations against Uyghurs, to the point that the US ended up putting iFlytech on a trade blacklist. What do you think a Chinese company's appearance on that particular blacklist should mean for New Zealand businesses dealing with that company? It should absolutely raise alarm bells that it is on this blacklist. There is some uh, real cause for concern and that we should not be dealing with them. But we are. In fact, iFlytech has links which go all the way to the beehive. How's that been allowed to happen when it's not hard to find out what else iFlytech is doing? 
As early as 2017, iFlyTech has been supplying kindergartens in rural Uyghur communities in, in southern Xinjiang with uh, smart robots that are um, uh, employed to help uh, minority children learn a uh, standard dialect of, of, of Chinese uh, known kind of popularly as, as, as Mandarin. Kindergartens like this, surrounded by barbed wire, the signs say only Chinese must be spoken. We don't know the circumstances that these young children are under to be placed in these kindergartens. Uh, have they been orphaned? Uh, are their parents forced to work in satellite factories, uh, etc.? Um, uh, so we should be concerned that these robots are, are, are being used on, on very young people, young minority people. The next concern relates to iFlyTech's work in the field of justice. There's endless glowing publicity about iFlyTech's voice recognition technology being used in criminal investigations and trials in provinces across China. This technology is being used uh, for, quote-unquote, smart courts and smart uh, prosecutions. In other words, that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's conceivable that Uyghurs are being put on trial uh, through, uh, through computers and computers that are being programmed by iFlyTech. iFlyTech says itself that the technology will assist with interrogation rooms and reform, which clearly has frightening potential for an ethnic minority being persecuted by the government. So why would this Auckland tech company, Rokos Global, sign a partnership deal with iFlyTech? We're at the dawn of the golden age of robotics, and at Rokos we're excited about accelerating this industry for good. Certainly, uh, I wouldn't want any of my profits coming from a company uh, that is, is um, you know, essentially uh, aiding and facilitating the cultural erasure of a, of, a, of, a, of a people. Rokos has said publicly the partnership is for commercial purposes only, and that its platform is not used for military or police applications. We'd like to know how Rokos is able to guarantee that, because our advice is, it can't. There are so many questions. Hello. Hello, is that David? Yes, it is. Hi, David. It's Paula Penfold calling from Stuff. You'll be aware that we've been in contact with Rokos regarding wanting to talk about your partnership with iFlyTech? Uh, yes. We have sent you our correspondence with why we are not interested in being interviewed. Yeah, I mean, all it says is that Rokos was not involved, but, but not involved in, in what? I mean, the central question is clearly that you have a relationship with a Chinese company which is known for its role in the human rights abuses against Uyghurs. And I'd, I'd like to know how you navigate that partnership, how you justify that partnership. I would appreciate if you could follow the request for our media channel. If you won't talk about it, can you please assure me then, if we put these questions to you in writing, will you respond? I'm asking you to follow the standard media yeah, channel. And I'm asking you, you and I'm asking you for an undertaking that if I do that, if we follow again that media channel, will you answer our questions? I'm absolutely can confirm that I will review anything that you send via our media channels. So we send off a list of questions via the media channels. The bigger point about Rokos, though, is who owns it? Because the answer, at least in part, is you do. Through this, it's a small stake, only 3.54%, but it's who it's with that matters. The Aspire New Zealand Seed Fund, which is owned by the government. The New Zealand government will try to distance itself by saying that its shareholding is small um, and that it has no real influence. Is that a defence? Absolutely not. I don't think you can separate, uh, you know, any so-called uh, positive relationships with a company that's doing uh, very dangerous and destructive things. And it's not about the quantity uh, of the partnership or the quantity of the shareholding, uh, but that the shareholding exists uh, at all. You're talking about very small shareholdings, but if the New Zealand government wants to look I guess, live by its values, it really needs to satisfy itself that it's happy to collaborate with companies like iFlyTech. And it's not only through that small shareholding in Rokos that the government has a link to iFlyTech. The majority shareholder in Rokos is Icehouse Ventures, which also has its own direct partnership with iFlyTech.
and Ice House Ventures get $700,000 a year from the government. Ice House Ventures also refuses an interview saying its relationship with iFlyTech is no different to any of its other partnerships. Well, hardly, since this partnership is with a company directly involved in the human rights abuses of Uyghurs. Icehouse also says it's difficult to vet all aspects of what its partners do, even though the concerns about iFlyTech are easily found online. But stepping back, what about the government and its financial ties to Icehouse Ventures and Rokos? I don't think there's anything wrong with the New Zealand government supporting innovative New Zealand companies. Um, the issue might arise where that company is in a collaboration with a problematic Chinese company. I think the government probably should um, assess the optics of tacitly supporting a collaboration like that. Yeah, the, what the Chinese government is, is doing is a, is a crime against humanity. Uh, the New Zealand government should not share this activity. You've been here for in New Zealand for what nearly half your life now. Yeah. 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 What do you, as a New Zealand citizen, what do you want our government to do? I want a New Zealand government to wake up. Yeah, I want a New Zealand government to care. Which seem fair points to make to the government, but just as we're about to do that, this happens. Rokos does a massive 180. It arrives in a very short email, answering none of our questions, but saying Rokos is no longer involved in any projects with iFlyTech, and there are no future projects planned. And then Icehouse Ventures changes tack too, saying its board has requested an investigation into the relationship with iFlyTech. Which is something, but why has it taken our inquiries to force Rokos and Icehouse Ventures to act? And how can the government publicly say it's concerned about China's treatment of Uyghurs, when if you look closely you'll see it is financially linked to two New Zealand entities, which happily partnered with a Chinese company directly involved in those very same human rights abuses. For weeks we've been asking for an interview with Foreign Minister Nanaya Mahuta. In her first major speech, she spoke of New Zealand values and said, we will advocate for ethical investment. So what will the government do about its embarrassing links to iFlyTech? And it's bigger than that. Why is any New Zealand business allowed to profit from partnering with dangerous Chinese companies. But we don't get a chance to ask those questions. Eventually, the minister says no to an interview. We ask why, but she doesn't give a reason. The repression of Uyghurs has been building for decades. Xinjiang is a vast province closer geographically and culturally to Turkic countries than to Beijing. Its location on the Silk Road means it's at the heart of China's strategic Belt and Road Initiative, the bridge to Central Asian, Middle Eastern and European markets. So for this project to be successful, China needs a stable land, stable Xinjiang. So now the Uyghur people became a problem. They thought Uyghur people is a factor of instability and what they are doing is a final solution. The mostly Muslim minority of 12 million have lived here for centuries. China calls it Xinjiang, which translates to New Frontier. Uyghurs reject that name because it's no New Frontier to them, it's home. They call it East Turkestan, sometimes simply Uyghurland. I think this is the really right name, Uyghurland. Because to remind them, we never give up. We lived there thousands of years and we built our culture, we built our history, and we lived there generation and generation. And then this happened. Protest escalated into a riot in 2009. 200 people were killed. China blamed Uyghur separatists to justify a brutal crackdown, releasing propaganda videos to support its case. What the CCP wants to remove includes praying or having a long beard or wearing a burqa. This person uh, prays five times a day, 15 years. This person is a writer, 15 years, just like, uh, like that. 
uh, they all got 15 years of sentence. Putting whole population as an um, as a target that this whole population is a terrorist is completely wrong. They cannot do that. Yet they are. The first reports of mass extrajudicial detention began to emerge in 2017. At first, the Chinese government tried to deny the internment camps existed. And it took about a year for the Chinese Communist Party to cobble together a story and a narrative that suggests that these were vocational training centres. So activists and academics began to trawl the internet for evidence, finding the CCP's own documents such as tenders to prove the camps were being built to detain people without any legal process. And the conditions in the de detention centres uh, are very, very harsh. Uh, they share rooms with up to a dozen other people. Uh, they only have one toilet. Um, there are mandatory study sessions, and much of the day is spent uh, viewing kind of de-radicalization uh, films, uh, films about uh, so-called illegal religious practice, uh, and then uh, memorizing patriotic cadences. Uh, and and this, so these are, are, are individuals who are taken out of society but haven't been actually formally charged uh, of a crime, nor have they been convicted of a crime. My um, young younger brother and also my uh, brother-in-law has been detained. There's been no trial? There's no, been nothing, no, nothing. Nothing? No. He's a father? He is, um, yeah, he's a father of uh, three children. Is he a terrorist? No, he's, he's, he's not a terrorist. A separatist and extremist? No, no, not, never. One of them, even in the jail, for 11 years sentences, my big brother. What was the sentence for? What is the charge? I hear it says, Double face. Double face like terrorism? What does that mean? Because maybe he didn't follow the rule. When were you last able to speak with your brother? Maybe five years. In 2019, the Chinese government then tried to claim what it called trainees had all graduated from the supposed vocational re-education centres. But Australian researchers used satellite imagery to identify 380 suspected detention facilities to prove they were still being built. You can see these centres, the largest of which is about five kilometres long, just appear kind of out of the desert in Xinjiang, some of them. You'll see um, multiple layers of fencing, high walls, um, watchtowers, um, sometimes a particularly chilling example was there's a caged, sort of wire cage entrance tunnel from the, the processing centre where detainees arrive. Um, they're, they're frightening and forbidding places. Remember how we said journalists can't freely report? I hadn't even got to baggage claim before the police were there waiting for me. Well, this is what happens when they try. Okay. So what happened? And then, right now I can what listen happened? to you. Yes, what happened? Nothing. These men were obstructing us. All we were doing was walking on the street. Uh -huh. We were doing nothing. Anna Fifield was last in Xinjiang in 2020. They were following us and monitoring us at every step. What did you see in relation to internment camps, detention centres. They have built many uh, much more traditional prisons around the place. So they've moved into a situation where they are treating people like criminals uh, now much more than they were previously. On which note, you are aware that we're looking at the case of Maulan Nur Muhammad. So he's serving a nine-year sentence at Bayya Prison in Shahidza city, which is run by the XPCC. What, what is that? 
Yes, yeah, so this is a, um, a construction company, but it is owned and operated by the Bing Tuan, which is this paramilitary organization in, uh, it's part of China's security apparatus, but it operates only in this Xinjiang area. And they have really been at the forefront of the Chinese government's efforts to keep this population under control there. You can see by uh, driving around these places that there are work areas, hard labour areas near these prisons. One NGO describes it as an open pit mine for clay, for bricks. Oh, that means um, they, are, uh, like they, they use detainism in a forced labour? Correct. Mm. Nobody should be forced to in that kind of labour. I insist that my brother should be released. He should be freed. Rizwan girl Nur Muhammad has tried in the past to email the prison, but got no response. It's a long shot because there's no phone number publicly available. But with the help of sources and a translator, we finally get a number to try. He said, I'm sorry, I need I can't verify your identity, so I can't help you. We keep trying, but he won't pick up again. Riz has also asked the Chinese embassy for answers, but has received nothing. So today, she's trying a direct approach. I'm here to demanding a humanitarian response. From the Chinese consulate? Yes. Okay, and what will you ask for specifically, do you think? If you get to speak to anybody? I will ask you free my brother because he's innocent. We are demanding the Chinese consulate the highest official entity of the Chinese government in New Zealand to respond to us, to release my brother, bring a complete stop to my family's suffering. Yeah, but sorry, my dear. They said the consulate doesn't want to talk to you. Yes, my dad says He doesn't want to talk to us either. He hasn't responded to our request for an interview. Mr. Ron Ping. What is follow? But today is a festival in Auckland to celebrate the Chinese New Year, a public opportunity to put questions. We're investigating the case of Mr. Maulan Nur Muhammad, who your embassy is familiar with. He's a Uyghur man who's imprisoned in Bay Prison in Shahidza City. What we want to know is what is the evidence for that conviction against uh, Mr. Nur Muhammad? And we'd like to see the evidence of there being a trial for Mr. Nur Muhammad. Uh, I think, uh, I believe the, the Chinese uh, uh, legal system and it's uh, workable and uh, can I you think then any show kinds, us? Uh, kind of the cases uh, can, can be uh, trialed in a fair uh, process. Good, yeah. if there has been fair process, can you yeah. please provide us with the evidence of that fair process and a transcript of the trial and the oh. evidence of the charge against him that has led to his imprisonment for nine uh, years? Yes, uh, actually it's not my job. So we follow up with the Chinese embassy, reiterating our request, but their reply tells us only what we already know, giving us no evidence, no proof of a trial. What else is left for Riz then? What is the government doing to help her? Senior officials did meet with the Chinese embassy, but we've seen the resulting correspondence, and China supplies no new information and simply brushes off Maolan's case as a domestic issue. It's true, he's not a New Zealand citizen, but Riz is. And when the minister speaks of values guiding our diplomacy and that we champion human rights, why aren't we doing that for Riz? Should we be letting the Chinese brush this off in this way when a New Zealand citizen is bravely trying to help her brother? I think New Zealand should be speaking out about this case and the other cases, you know, and the whole situation in Xinjiang at every opportunity. What's happening to Uyghurs in Xinjiang is an issue not just for the government, but for all of us. 
because there's mounting evidence of forced Uyghur labour in Xinjiang, but also of workers being forcibly moved to factories across China. And here in New Zealand, our shelves are lined with products made by global brands that are household names, which have been linked to that forced Uyghur labour. What happens in those factories? Uyghur workers are kept in separate dormitories. Um, they're constantly surveilled. They have to attend um, patriotic education, um, have to attend Mandarin classes. They're not generally not allowed to practice their religion. A Washington Post journalist visited one of the factories we found and found it was surrounded by high walls, barbed wire fences. That journalist was Anna Fifield. There were thousands of Uyghur, mainly young women, who had been shipped from Xinjiang to this relatively remote place to work in a factory. What was being made in that factory? So this was one of Nike's biggest factories in the world. And Nike had previously undertaken to uh, to do its due diligence and make sure that its supply chain was clean and it was clearly just patently not. It's not only Nike. Will there be other big global brands tainted by forced Uyghur labour selling their products here in New Zealand? Absolutely. The research has shown that big international car companies, computer companies, clothing companies across the board have links in their supply chains to forced Uyghur labour from Xinjiang. Other countries have legislated to prevent the sale of products made through forced labour. New Zealand has not. Yeah, I hope that the government will be paying attention and seeing that it can take a stand and it can add its voice to this international chorus. I mean, I think there are cases where we can actually do things about it, as in the case of the Nike factory in Qingdao and where they stopped that practice. But even if it doesn't result immediately in a change of practice, it's incumbent on us to stand up and say, this is wrong and we don't want to support this, or we don't want any part of this, like, we object and we will find a way to make sure we're not part of it. Is there reticence because of the um, clearly very complicated political and trade ramifications uh, when you do bring in such legislation? Oh, it's hard to be pro-slavery. I mean, I think, <laughs> I think it should be um, pretty straightforward that um, no one wants to be buying goods made with forced labour. So if there's reticence, I don't see why there should be. What the Chinese Communist Party is doing to Uyghurs is the largest scale detention of religious minorities since World War II. But try talking about it with Chinese officials here. No, it's uh, totally fake news. It's totally fake news. Mr. Wan, there is evidence coming out every day from former detainees. There is satellite imagery of the building of detention centres. There is the Chinese government's own documentation of tenders being let for the building of detention centres. There is evidence of forced sterilisation of Uyghur people, of women being forced to undergo abortions. Mm, well, this uh, is the evidence, Mr. Wang. It's fake news. It's from the, some uh, institute in Australia. And then they found that this institute Funded that by the, the uh, Department of policy. States of the United States. That the so the information uh, provided by the U.S. So that's the fake news. It's truly fake the news. The Australian yeah, so I, uh, yes, I, I don't want to uh, discuss research. that. Uh, uh, yeah. And Mr. Wang, in terms of the treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang, New Zealand citizens cannot even communicate sorry, sorry, with yeah, their yeah, relatives I think, uh, in Xinjiang. Today, uh, so you, you just uh, uh, talk about this kind of uh, uh, fake news. Well, I, I, I cannot make any comments on that. It's every single, every it's single member I, of I the tell you. Every single member of the Uyghur community we have spoken to in New Zealand as uh, family members or friends who have uh, been detained by the Chinese uh, government in Xinjiang. I, I don't want to talk to you about that uh, uh, once again. It's baseless. It's baseless. It is, it is not baseless, Mr. Awan. Mr. Awan, there is evidence coming out every single day about the atrocities being committed by the Chinese government against the Uyghur people. Maybe after several years you will know the truth. Yeah. Or maybe the people directly affected by the atrocities know the truth already. Mr. Awan, is there something that you will say to the members of the Uyghur community in New Zealand? 
Mr. Rowan, is there something you will say to the members of the Mika community in New Zealand? I have kind of pretended to be strong. I have I didn't allow myself myself to cry for a long time. But I think this kind of stress or anxiety and concern has been going on and on now more than three years. So I think it it really it's really painful. I I want him to be released immediately and I really want to sit with him and eat with him at the same table. I miss those moments. Thank you.